Hello, I'm Kay Benbow, a freelance children's media specialist, and some of you will remember me from my time at CBeebies. I have a long association with the Children's Media Conference and have been attending almost from the first gathering, when it was known as Show Commotion. It's a warm and welcoming event which I look forward to each July. It enables me to keep in touch with colleagues from across the children's production community and also make new connections. I'm always keen to meet the next generation of content creators dedicated to serving our youngest audience. They need you and deserve the very best. The keynote speech which made a huge impression on me was given by Lem Sisse, MBE, in 2016. I knew of Lem as a gifted poet, but confessed that I knew little about his personal history. When he spoke about his childhood and the challenges he faced, in fact the downright cruelty he endured in the care system, I realised how fortunate I had been to have such a happy childhood during my own early years. I found Lem's speech shocking and heartbreaking, but ultimately uplifting and inspirational. Here is a man who never forgot how it felt to be a child in care and counts his proudest achievement as the annual Christmas dinners he has set up for those leaving the care system. I will never forget one of the young women in his film saying that for the first time in her life she felt that someone cared about her. Now as a means of introduction for you to me and in answer to the director of an art centre, I've had this throughout my career by the way, in the south of England, who told me I get all of my work because I'm black, implying that an indebted, a guilt-ridden industry had through osmosis over 25 years and across the world mutually agreed to employ me, <laughs> to assuage its universal guilt. Um, then I will give you my uh, biog to him. My name's Lem Sisse, I'm a poet, I'm an honorary doctor of letters twice. I'm the first poet commissioned to write for the London 2012 Olympics. A few days ago I read a specially commissioned poem as part of the national commemoration of the song to the 2,000 people live at Heaton Park in Manchester. I'm the official poet of the FA Cup 2015. It was broadcast at Wembley just before the plays came out and could be found online. My poem on the left field album sold millions in the year 2000. My most recent play was an adaptation of Benjamin Zephaniah's Refugee Boy. My Lambert poems could be found on walls around the country in public spaces from the Royal Festival Hall to the British Council offices in Addis Ababa. The school your poem Guilt of Cain was unveiled by Bishop Desmond Tutu in the city of London where it stands to this day. I read my poetry with Sir Paul McCartney at his book launch, edited by the late great children's author Adrian Mitchell. I'm an MBE. I'm an MBE. A Mancunian black ethnic. The MBE was given to me by the Queen of England for services to literature. My TED Talks from the Houses of Parliament have been viewed by over a million people. My head Desert Island Discs on BBC Radio 4 was chosen as pick of the year 2015. The play about my life, Something Dark, has toured the world and, and was made into a, a, an award-winning BBC Radio 4 play. This month my poems can be found on the new Baba Mal album. I'm Chancellor of the University of Manchester, which has the largest on-site student population in the United Kingdom, is the only Russell Group University with social responsibility as a central goal. In 2014-15, we attracted more than £345 million in external research funding. We have the largest student community in the UK, more than 1,000 degree programmes with 12,000 staff. We're one of the largest employees in Greater Manchester. We have an annual income of over a billion pounds. I've read poetry everywhere, from the Library of Congress in the United States to the Palace of His Imperial Real Majesty Emperor Haile Selassie in Ethiopia, from the Botanic Gardens of Singapore to the, to the sonorous shores of Sri Lanka, from Wembley Football Stadium to Maryland Football Stadium, from the theatres of Bangalore to the theatre of Dubai. I've flown to schools in Zurich colleges in, in Virginia. I've taught teachers in Addis Ababa and children in Cameroon. I'm a proud participant of 10 pieces, which described by the Director General Tony Hall as the biggest uh, commitment the BBC has ever made to music education in our country. And I'll be presenting with Naomi Wilkinson later this month at the proms of the Royal Albert Hall. I'm I'm published by Bloomsbury, I'm published by Canongate. My sixth book, Gold from the Stone, is out later this year. I'm patron of the Letterbox Club, who get books to children in care throughout the country. I've read poetry in the Arctic. I've made BBC radio documentaries on W.H. Auden, J.B. Priestley, Bob Marley, The Last Poets, Gil Scott Heron, to name a few. I inspire the Christmas dinners for care leavers in Manchester, London, Liverpool, Leeds. I'm a fellow of the, of the Foundling Museum, where my exhibit, Superman was a Foundling, exhibits to this day. My photograph is in the National Portrait Gallery. I've been photographed by Greg Williams, Steve McCurry, Rankin, and I pity, I pity the young black boy who walks into your art centre, who you will use at will to do what you call a tick boxing exercise as you gently push him towards a workshop on urban music and I pity you that you can make such a statement to someone, me, who it is easy to research. If this is your level of understanding when it comes to someone like me, then I pity anyone of colour who walks into your institution. Maybe, maybe, I said to him, I should call the 
Arts Council tomorrow and give them some feedback as to what you have said to me tonight. One of the greatest gifts I've been given is the knowledge to know my success has nothing to do with, with, with any of that list I've just run down. And then I'll explain why. But first, I'd like to share with you the greatest thing that I've ever done in my adult life, the greatest thing that I've ever done. It was to choose and then gather a group of dynamic people together and say to them, I want a Christmas dinner for care leavers on Christmas Day. 6% of care leavers go to university compared to 38% of all young people. One third of care leavers are not in education, employment or training, compared with 13% of all young people. More than one in ten children have three or more placements in 2010. 23% of the adult prison population has been in care and 40% of prisoners under 21 were... 40% were in care as children. A, a quarter of young women leaving care are pregnant or already mothers, and nearly half of them become mothers by the age of 24. Nobody's getting paid, I tell to those people around the table. Uh, I'm not setting up an organisation. This is not an organisation. Nobody is the boss. Okay, that's how we're going to work together. I want a venue, I want incredible jaw-dropping presents, I want all the young people to get taxis to pick them up and drop them off. <laughs> I want the food to be top-notch enough to be a professional chef. I want volunteers who are all uh, checked and balanced professional and skilled. The organisation steering group must have, have over 100 years experience of working with young people in care. The steering group must have an equal number of creatives on it, artists, writers, clowns, teachers, anything to stop it becoming institutionalised. There's no organisation, no websites, no letter-headed paper. Also, I want it to be more organised than organisations organised. I want there to be more checks and balances than they checked or balanced. Also, I'm not checking with how many care leavers are in this area. I know we're here. The highest standards of accountability and checks and balances from accredited kitchens to referral forms for the young people. Each Christmas dinner will have a contingency of £5,000. By the way, we have no money. Uh, we must raise the presence from the community and the venue. We must believe in the community to believe in the care lever. Otherwise, all they will do is read about them in newspapers. Jeez, la freaking wheeze. In 2013, it was in Manchester, one group. Uh, in 2014, it was in Manchester in London. In 2015, it was in Manchester, London and Leeds. And this year, it'll be in Manchester, London, Leeds and Oxford. Each area organises independently. A charity holds the money that we've raised and it is distributed. I've written up a how-to guide. There are no workers. There is no empirical structure, which is available. The how-to guide is available to anyone who wants to, it online. It's open source. On Christmas Day, me and a few friends get together a special Christmas dinner video which includes stars from Coronation Street, EastEnders, Breakfast TV, Amanda Holden, Gogglebox, The Only Way is Essex, and they make gentle messages of Christmas wishes only for these people. The only people to have seen those videos are all these kids, uh, 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 these young adults. And every now and again, someone special comes down, knitting Gantra stayed for three hours, and he loved it on Christmas Day. What a man. The care leavers were besides themselves that he would spend time out to hear me reading as if I'm reading from paper. Uh, <laughs> Help me. <laughs> I am just a poor boy. So, yeah, I knew it was needed because the worst days of my life have been birthdays and Christmases. And, well, your childhood actually is lived out in your adulthood. And the more that you deny that, the more evident it is. It's been the best day of your life, mate. It was absolutely amazing, so thank you very much. You know, for once in my life, I felt like someone actually cared about me. It was actually a pretty good day. Well done, it was really fun, the food was amazing, thank you. And I love my presents so much, they're incredible. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you for all our presents. Thank you. All everyone's come together and the vibe and the atmosphere in the room is untouchable, really. Life, mate. <laughs> I've loved every minute of it, mate. It's been great. Bit do it again next year. I don't want to go home. I'm staying tonight. Christmas party. Locking. <laughs> even got Christmas bloody. And I've met all my best mate, Worsley. Oh, shut up. Lem went on to explain that he has spent his whole life trying to work out who he is and that he had now found his family and pieced together his history. You really need to hear him tell his story. But one other heartbreaking moment struck me 
when he explained that when he found success with his poetry, he had no point of reference, no one to share and celebrate with. He lost the only family he had ever known at the age of 12 when his foster parents sent him back to the care of the local authority. Yet he insists that he is not defined by his scars, but by his ability to heal. In my early to late teens, whenever I said I was a black man, there'd always be somebody who says, you're not black, you're a human being. <laughs> you're a human being. A human being. Um, it's like saying to a child, it's like a child saying in a mathematics lesson to the teacher, uh, do you know you're using numbers? <laughs> you know, because I'm a black man, it doesn't mean to say I'm not saying that I'm a human being. Do you know what I mean? Imagine this, right? I imagine this. If a woman says, I'm a woman, and then a man says to her, <laughs> No, love. <laughs> you are a human being. <laughs> what would she think about him? How would she ass assess his intelligence? How would she assess her place in his world? No, love. You are a human being. <laughs> what would she think about working with him, alongside him, that she defined herself in such a way that was not good enough because no love, you're a human being. As if to deny what he was saying would uh, put her out of the human race somehow. As if naming it herself, how she wanted to define herself, was somehow a counter to a, a, a deeper understanding of herself, as given by the man. Um, the alternative, people have said to me all of my life, I don't see colour. I'm, I'm colour blind. <laughs> Are you? Are you really? It's a freaking disability. <laughs> brain bleed. It's like seeing someone with no legs and saying, I don't see legs. <laughs> Mentally, I'm a paraplegic. <laughs> and uh, in any way, why do people always say that they don't see colour when they see colour? Unless lots of black or white people are sort of sit around and say, you know just randomly say to each other, oh, I don't see colour. <laughs> so I'm getting it now. The only time a person who says that they're colour blind says that they don't see colour is when they see a person of colour. My word. <laughs> if there's one thing I know, it's that racism is in all countries and all cultures. Uh, I've travelled the world and I've seen it. There's racism from Ethiopians to Eritreans and vice versa. Racism from Jamaicans to Bayesians and vice versa. Racism from Indians to Caribbeans and vice versa. From South Africans to Zimbabweans and vice versa. In fact, in fact, truth is, if there is one learned behaviour, and it's learned, that unites the human race, it is... Maybe we should have a concert. <laughs> A racism concert. <laughs> where we all get together, kick ten colours of shit out of each other. And then... Group hug. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and just so you know, ladies and gentlemen, I see myself as an Englishman, uh, as an Ethiopian, as a collection of molecules, as an egg. <laughs> Uh, and anything my imagination so creates me to be. My question has never been what am I or what am I not, uh, but uh, why on the basis of the colour of my skin would you think either less of me or do less of me? Um, I am going to share my story with you for a reason. Uh, oh, I, I forgot my clicker. Uh, did I say that out loud? Uh, I've spent most of my adult life proving uh, what happened to me as a child because all family is is a group of people proving that each other exists over a lifetime. Birthdays, deaths, marriages, weekends, holidays you didn't want to go to. All family is is a set of disputed memories between one group of people over a lifetime. <laughs> and uh, I can't tell you what has taken for me to 
to find that sentence. My life up until the 18 years of age had been uh, a lie and I wrote poetry I, I bore witness throughout my time in care. From the moment I left the children's homes I made a, a freedom of information request to see my files. I had to write to the social services as a customer. There were 18 years of files written about me every three months from my birth and I never received them. I was an experiment that should never know what happened to it or who did it. And within three years of leaving the children's homes, I had a double page in the Guardian newspaper written about my second book of poetry. And it read, Lemsisse has success written all over his forehead. And I knew then that any success would be a nail in my coffin because I was relative to no one. And all our independences and successes are all relative to somewhere, to someone, to something. And that meant that every time I was recognised, it would be a another nail in my coffin but I continued we think ourselves independent I have a wife I have a child I have a house I have a job and we look back at our parents see what I've done or oh, screw you I've done it but we're looking back to a point of reference from where we are independent we're only independent because we have a point of reference it is all relative and you re only realise this when you have children yourself and you start doing the same thing to them. Now, will you cut your, cut your blooming, eat your food, eat your, eat your sandwich, eat your sandwich. And you hear your own mother saying the same thing to, you, dad, to yourself and you feel the sense of resentment that you had to her and you find yourself doing it and you don't call her up to say, I'm sorry, I resented what you did, I'm doing the same thing myself. That's the privilege of family, and that's what I didn't have. And I wouldn't wish it on my own worst enemy to know what I know about the love between a parent and a child and not have children, as I don't. I knew that before it happened to you, I would have to wait for my... Oh, God, yeah. When I left care, I realised that I would have to wait for my friends to have children to understand what I understood already. I would have to wait for them to lose a parent to realise that I knew that... It took me from the ages of 18 to 32 to find my family. I used all of my resources, what I made from poetry, <laughs> to do it. Uh, and now I found them all over the world, all over the world. Not only did I find my family, but I found a country. I can safely say that I'm both British and Ethiopian, that I performed in Addis Ababa to packed audience of my own people, recorded BBC documentaries then, and that, and, and that it is we who are excluded and who know the greatness of pain that will do our utmost to stop it happening to anyone else of any race, gender or sexuality. I'm not defined by my scars, but by the incredible ability to heal. Do you have any idea how important it was for me as that child to see the face, <laughs> to see the face of Fluella Benjamin on the television? Do you have any idea? what that meant to me, to see a black face along with other white faces. And I could look at it and go, that's, that's something about that. I didn't meet a black person until I was 10. I didn't know a black person until I was 16. I didn't meet a black person until I was 10. So I peered through the television at you, Fluella Benjamin, with your beads and your songs and your absolute otherness. And on some level, I knew that I was not colorblind. I was not invisible. I was somebody and I mattered. And I dedicate this entire a keynote address to you, Fluella, and to the incredible Caribbean people who have fought tooth and nail on the front line of unfriendly, disrespectful studios and venues up and down the country teaching lighting technicians that they need to light black skin properly, and who smiled in adversity, so close to the word diversity, adversity. Thank you, and thank you to those who have learned that your way of living, um, Fluella, uh, and leading by example, first and foremost, is the ultimate lesson for us all, especially right now. For me, it's not about political correctness at all. The world is made better by seeing more people from the world in whatever we do. This is an anomaly. Sesame Street used black characters against the prevailing wind of racism. It's not political correctness. It's about the market. And it's about the truth. The future is what Floella and those commissioners who commissioned saw. 
uh, and to make a, a better show and a, a better society, um, it must include people of many different races. The act of doing it is a celebration of humanity. And to be honest, the internet's around. <laughs> it is the ultimate celebration of migration. By coincidence, as I was asked to choose a CMC keynote, I was listening to Lem read his autobiography, My Name is Why, which was published last year. It's intensely moving. For me, Lem Sisse embodies human goodness and resilience because he has never lost his humanity or forgotten how it felt to be a child. I should end on a quote. When I came to you, I came to the registration, to these beautiful, incredible young minds. And the, the young girl who's darker of skin, uh, she wasn't there. So I, I was met by a wall of white. And, and they're all incredible, by the way. Each one of these young people are incredible. No doubt about it. <coughs> But the thing about diversity is it has to happen on every level and it's incredibly empowering for everybody. I'm so honoured to have been invited here and I just want to thank you for, uh, for listening to me. The truth is, is, is that when you see that, you have to ask a question. Do you, are you with me? And it's in front of you. And it's in front of you. So it's not complicated diversity. It really is not complicated. We make it complicated because often we're quite defensive about it because it shows a, a certain ad possibly inadequacy in us. But I don't believe that we are inadequate. I do believe that we asking the questions leads to great answers. I, I'm, I'm done with guilt. We've got the answers. Children's TV in particular has been incredible for featuring black characters and characters of other races and disabilities. I mean, way ahead of the, uh, ahead of the game. I don't want to end on a negative. Oh, don't, oh. <laughs> it's been an honor and a pleasure. Thanks a lot. <laughs>